origins and meanings of psychosis. So let's first of all emphasize the S on the end of meanings. There is no one meaning of, of madness. So everybody who experiences whatever we want to call madness, there will be a different meaning for that person, which then makes it very hard to um, research scientifically. But that's, that's one of the things about, about madness. Um, we all have our theories about what are the major causes, but for each individual person going through it, it will have a different meaning. Um, but that is very different from our dominant model that we have at the moment, which kind of says there is no meaning. The dominant model says this is something wrong with your genes or your biochemistry or a combination thereof, and it really has no meaning other than the fact that you have this illness called schizophrenia causing you to have these experiences. And the other thing I just want to preface everything with is the battle that I'm going to describe between psychosocial and biological causes is only relevant in some parts of the world, including our own. In many parts of the world, um, there is no need for an explanation for hearing voices. It is just a part of life that is accepted as a normal part of, of life. So in New Zealand, where I was for 20 years, um, Māori just experienced hearing voices as just ordinary part of life. It's often, uh, their, their explanations for it, it's often ancestors uh, speaking to them. Um, not always good stuff, sometimes a dead grandma telling them off or warning them about something, but it's assumed it has meaning. So it's only in, in um, sort of so-called developed countries where we have this idea that it has, these things have no meaning, and then we start fighting about whether it's psychosocial or, or biological. In the time I've got, obviously I'm, I will be making what for some of you are strong, might seem strong statements. If you are interested in the research, more of the research, although I will be showing you a fair amount, um, that's a book that 23 of us put together to try and bring together all the research, including a large number of, of psychiatrists. So it's always good to have somebody to blame. So everything is this guy's fault. Emil Kreplin, at the end of the 19th century, invented the illness that we still use today. He, he called it dementia precox, but it quickly became called schizophrenia. Um, by the eighth edition of his book, um, he had hun literally hundreds and hundreds of symptoms of this new illness that I say he invented, he thinks he discovered. Um, there were things uh, like, uh, it was an endless list, of, uh, my, some of my favorites are going into church with a lighted cigar, um, falling in love with people regardless of how ugly they are, um, uh, some, of, some of it's not funny, uh, uh, I remember this quote word for word, homosexuality and other anomalies are often indicated in the whole dress and mannerisms of the patients. Can, I'm going to hold questions and stuff um, till, till the panel discussion later, if that's, if that's okay. We will have half an hour then. Um, it's, it's, an endless, it's quite an endless list. Looking back, you can see it's a list of broken social norms of the time and uh, of that time and place. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating read, actually. Um, here's just one example of how to make the social context, how to ignore the social context and make people look crazy, which is quite easy to do. If you just um, call somebody schizophrenic and then watch them closely for the next 24 hours, anything odd they do in that next 24 hours, you just describe to the, and we all do odd things, whether we like to admit it or not. Um, it's a grainy photograph because it's a, a long, uh, it's very old. Um, these people have been stood like this for several hours, so obviously something weird's going on. Um, they were exhibiting the symptom of uh, waxy flexibility, which is a symptom of catatonic schizophrenia. And it would have been nice to ask them why they stood like that. And to be fair to Kreplin, he did actually ask them, and he, they answered with, I have to do it, it happens to order. In other words, the psychiatrist told them to stand like that. It's still a bit mad, isn't it, to stand like that just because somebody tells you to, until you remember that it's the psychiatrist who decides if you get to go home, and at this point in history, your chances of going home lifetime was 50%. So you do what the psychiatrist tells you. But why would a psychiatrist do such a silly thing? To find out if they had another symptom called automatic obedience. This is, there's a, it's a not very polite word for this, it's called a mind fuck because either way, you're in trouble. Um, it's a cheap shot, and we don't do anything like this these days, do we? Well, we'll come back to that. Um, meanwhile, they just said it's an illness. Trust us, it's a biological illness. 
with genetic basis. We have no idea where to look for that. We've got no evidence to support that claim, but trust us, it will be discovered later, which is a great clause. Anytime you want to make a ridiculous statement and you have no evidence for it, just say later. Give me the evidence later. Interestingly, the geneticists are still using that line 100 years later. They're always on the edge of finding the genetic basis for schizophrenia, depression, or anything else. But my favorite one was in 1997 when they discovered the gene for unemployment. But that's another lecture. Um, they're still saying, give us more money. We're nearly there. We will discover it later. In the meantime, we'll jump to the present now, but in the meantime, we were doing some interesting things to uh, people who are considered Mad. This is hanging people from the ceiling until they go sane. This is the calming box, which I wouldn't find particularly calming. Um, this is the spinning people around until they go unconscious, and then when you wake up, suddenly you're cured. And here's something we also don't do any... Oh, yes, unfortunately, this is something that hopefully in 10 years' time, someone will be able to stand on a stage and say, we don't do this anymore. This is electroconvulsive therapy, still used on over 2,000 people a year in England and about a million people around the world. But that also is another lecture. So let's just get some language issues dealt with. And let's just be clear that whenever anybody uses the word schizophrenia, they're talking nonsense. And what I mean by that is it has no reliability or validity. Reliability is the capacity for people to agree on a, a, a scientific construct before you do any research on it. You have to be able to have 10 people, or at least nine out of 10 people agree on what it is. Otherwise, you can't do any research. There has never been any reliability or validity to this construct because it's hundreds and hundreds of different types of things. I'll quickly demonstrate that, save you a two-hour lecture on the reliability of the construct. Currently, this is our best attempt after um, 100 years to define it. This is in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. There are five types of symptoms, and you only need two to get the diagnosis. So I'm going to give all of you, if you don't mind, just for the next few minutes, you can have hallucinations and delusions and nothing else. And you can all have thought disorder and catatonia, but no hallucinations or delusions. Okay. So you two groups now have nothing in common, all right? but you have the same diagnosis. Do you understand how that, I mean, the scientific term for that is a disjunctive category. In ordinary language, it's just utter bollocks. It doesn't mean anything. But still, there are people who genuinely think there is a thing called schizophrenia that not only exists, but actually explains things. Why does someone hear voices? Ah, well, they have this thing inside them called schizophrenia that causes them to hear voices. Oh, well, that seems to make sense. Just as, you know, we used to think that depression was caused by depressing things. No, now it's caused by this thing inside you called major depressive disorder, which causes you to have depression. It's a backward circular logic. It doesn't um, really make any sense. Um, Quickly, before we go on to the actual causes, what does the public think that causes mental health problems? In every country except one, we'll come back to that one, when you do surveys of what causes schizophrenia or psychosis or whatever you want to call it, hearing voices, they say um, psychosocial events. Poverty, loneliness, uh, trauma, rape, violence, child abuse, stress at work, etc., etc. They include biological things, but way down the bottom of their, of their list. The one exception is a country that just gets everything wrong, it can't help itself, but if there's any Americans in the audience, I'll buy you a drink later. Um, that's interesting, though. It doesn't make them right. I mean, I have a fridge magnet that says, never underestimate the stupidity of large groups of people. It doesn't make them right. But this is the starting point for the average member of the public, which is, the, which are, which is who, obviously, contacts mental health services. Um, People with a diagnosis themselves of schizophrenia or psychosis, psychotic disorders have an even stronger psychosocial model. Here's just some examples of how strong the belief is that what's caused my problems, my hearing voices or my being paranoid, is that bad things have happened in my life. Uh, here's one study showing that 97% of people with this diagnosis rejected the medical model, said it's not an illness, bad things have happened to me. And the researchers immediately called that lack of insight. You know, if you're respectful and you're interested in what people think, you say, oh, that's, that's interesting. 97% of people think it's this. That must be worth looking at. No, no. 
that means you're wrong, and not only are you wrong, but lack of insight is a symptom of the illness that I say you've got and you say you haven't got. Mind fact number two. Talk your way out of that one. And the more you insist, no, 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 doctor, the more they say, see. And this is a real laugh or cry moment at the bottom they have now. Named this lack of insight, this disagreeing with your psychiatrist, we've given it a fancy name called anosognosia to make it sound like a medical thing. And they found which part of the brain causes you to disagree with your psychiatrist. Yeah, I don't know. Is that funny or is that just pathetic? I don't know. Uh, meanwhile, this needs updating, and it's probably a little better by now, but this is back in um, <clears throat> 2004. 0.4% um, of psychiatrists agree with the public. We, now, regardless of who's right or wrong, and I clearly have a view on who's right or wrong on this, that's very sad, this interaction that's repeated over and over again around the world of a very distressed person, perhaps angry, perhaps hurt, scared, upset, wanting to tell their story about what's happened to them and their belief that what's happened to them has caused their difficulty. And this well-meaning person over here who has been trained not to listen, or more accurately, has been trained to listen just enough to count the number of symptoms and tick them off and apply a, a label and then choose a color pill. And that's very sad, I think, for both sides of the equation. So this is how I like to phrase, I like to phrase my talks in a neutral, sort of calm sort of way. Who is right? Millions of people all over the world, including service users, carers, and the majority of mental health workers, or biological psychiatrists and drug company executives. I don't like to polarize things, I like to. I, I do this actually on purpose to remind us that we, those of us who think that madness and depression and everything else are caused by bad things happening, that we are in the majority, massively in the majority. Biological, biological psychiatrists are less than 1% of the mental health workforce, but we allow them to exercise an awful lot of power. Um, so the actual causes, it's a long list, and none of them by themselves cause psychosis, it's in combination. So I'm just going to want to do what the research says now, which, which means it's a little more limited, a bit less um, juicy in terms of personal meaning. These are just these are numbers, um, and large scale studies. These are the things that have been shown, question mark over genetic predisposition, um, to increase the chances of ending up with uh, hearing voices that are telling you bad things or getting a diagnosis of schizophrenia and so forth usually in combination. I'm not going to talk about all of them, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, we'll touch on two or three. Um, just to be clear, there is no evidence of a genetic predisposition. This is back in 2008 when they, the American Journal of Psychiatry reviewed all the previous studies and found nothing better than what would be expected by chance. Um, the, the methodologies used in genetic research for, around uh, psychiatric issues is very, very poor. Um, but let's just take a, a, a quick sidestep and ask the question, two questions. Can we identify a single person who has ever benefited anywhere in the world, ever, from genetic research into psychosis or depression? No, we, and, and, and we can't. And the next question is, what are we going to do? What would we have done if we had found the schizophrenia gene, which they have now admitted they have stopped looking for? They're now looking for lots of tiny genes that interact with one another so that they can keep getting their research money. What were we going to do? Do we want to narrow the gene pool somehow so that these, these people are not part of society anymore? Well, in America, there is genetic counselling that sits people down with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and suggests they might not want to have children. So there's this genetic stuff. Is, there's a research side to it and the poor methodology, but there's also a political side to it. Um, so the actual causes, this is now this is statistic, we're talking in generalities now. So for people in the room who have their own lived experience, they will have their own different stories and meanings. I'm, so I'm talking in terms of large-scale studies and what's the best predictors overall in a general sense. Poverty is the strongest statistical predictor of just about everything, um, not only in mental health, but across the board. Um, and this has been known for a long, long time. Here's one study where even among children with no family history of psychosis, the ones who grew up in deprived areas were seven times more likely to end up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. With no family history, 
So where's your genetic predisposition now? I'm now going to contradict myself because there is one thing which is more powerful even than poverty, and that's relative poverty. Um, relative poverty studies involve looking at comparing the top the income of the top 10% of a population with the bottom 10% and seeing how big the difference is. Um, so uh, here's our friend America getting everything wrong again, although the UK will have caught up. This is a few years out of date now, so the austerity measures in the Tory government will have meant UK is pretty much up to where USA is. So you can see a pretty long, a pretty straight connection. The line is pretty um, clear on the relationship between income and quality going across the bottom and rates of severe mental illness going up, up the side. But the, the main story from this slide is never include Italy in your research. Just, just another planet. Right, that's two groups of people I have to buy a drink for, the, plenty of Italians. So by the, end of, by the end of the talk, I'll owe everybody a drink. Actually. Another strong predictor, uh, apart from poverty, is ethnicity. So in all of these countries, um, you have high rates of people being diagnosed with schizophrenia or psychosis uh, for these ethnic minorities or immigrant groups. So again, in New Zealand, Māori were several times more likely to end up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. In the UK, there's several studies showing that um, black Africans are about nine times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, and unless you're going to go down a straight racist genetic route saying these people are somehow inherently more inclined to madness, than white people, which nobody says anymore. Hopefully nobody even thinks it. Obviously, there's psychosocial reasons here. This is, these are not biological medical phenomena. And there has been some very good research showing that these are the explanations for why there are higher rates of diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, in, in Britain and, and the USA um, amongst um, black and ethnic minorities. Right, so the area that I've done most of my research in is, is what used to be a very controversial area of the relationship between childhood abuse and neglect and psychosis. Um, not so controversial anymore. The, the people who attacked us most severely at the beginning are now saying, what's the big, what's the big deal? We, we always knew that was the case, John. There's nothing controversial here. But I can assure you, 20 years ago, when we started doing this sort of research, there was quite an uproar. So, just looking first of all at the rates of childhood sexual abuse in general, and this is why it's so hard to take in, because the numbers are, are so high. Even if you use the, the most conservative definition of child sexual abuse, where it has to be before 12, and it has to involve genital contact, 13, roughly 13%, and there's nothing unique about New Zealand, this is pretty much the same all over the world. So, it's not as uncommon as we would like to think, and then when you look at the overall effects um, for the abuse that um, included intercourse or attempted intercourse, 25 times more likely to try uh, to kill themselves. This is, this is women, we'll come on to men later. And 12 times more likely to end up in a psychiatric hospital. So, so you would think that our psychiatric hospitals are very well attuned to dealing with these sorts of issues, that people get asked about these sorts of things and that people are aware that this is a, a, an important issue. We haven't established causation yet. We're just looking at large, the number of people um, in our psych hospitals. Uh, if we look at the long-term effects of child abuse, it isn't just psychosis, of course. Um, it's just about every diagnosis is very highly predicted by um, child abuse, sexual or physical. And any way you measure severity, and there's lots of different ways research measures the severity of the disturbance of people, any way you measure it, um, child abuse is a very strong predictor. Um, so here's the overall prevalence within our psychiatric inpatients. Um, so roughly 69% of women and 60% of men in psychiatric inpatient services around the world will, um, when asked, will report sexual or physical abuse. Again, we haven't established causation. We've just established that there's a lot of it um, in this group of people. And that's without including the sorts of abuse and neglect that we were rather slow to include, such as uh, emotional abuse and, and neglect. And then there's other things. that It's not all about bad things that we do to one another. Um, so life has things that just happen, and it's nobody's fault. Um, so here's an interesting study. 
not the biggest study in the world, nearly 400 people, but this is the first episode of psychosis service. Um, people in that service were 12 times more likely than the general population to have had mum die or leave in the first eight years of their life. Again, wouldn't necessarily cause anything by itself. We can lose our mums and if there's somebody else around or whatever, it can be, can be okay. But again, these are sorts of things that you'd think mental health services would be very quick to be asking about in case people wanted to talk about it, in case it was a part of the picture for them. Anyway, by 2005, we put out our first review summarizing the uh, research at that point. Still considered a bit controversial, but um, we managed to get quite um, good media coverage because I, I'm one that believes that nobody reads research journals um, except you know, us, us academics, and it's not them that are going to create change. So we have to get these things out into the public domain, which is easier now with social media, but um, wasn't so easy in 2005. So we had, um, I'll just read you one, and the USA said, the cumulative impact of this research has swayed opinion in the profession's highest echelons. And I can remember us all sitting down the pub and thinking, that would be nice. <laughs> one day, but we, we are getting there. Some people said, not enough research yet, which is fair enough. Um, at that point, there was only about one or two studies every year. Now there's one every week. I can't keep up. I don't even follow it anymore, the relationship between child abuse and psychosis. Um, here's one. This is naughty on my part. This is, this is called cherry picking. This is the one I like to present at psychiatry conferences. Um, it's a large study, 8,500 people, but it looked at five types of um, childhood adversity sexual and physical abuse and emotional abuse and physical and emotional neglect. And the people that were unlucky enough to experience all five of those types of abuse as a child were 193 times more likely to end up with a diagnosis of psychosis. 193 times. And then rather naughtily, I like to ask the, the psychiatrists to come up with any study that comes anywhere near the strength of that sort of finding in terms of their biological theories. But that is cherry picking. Let me tell you what show you what the overall, in a minute I'll show you the overall picture. It's not 193 times when you put all the studies together. Uh, here's one more review, it's just a, a nice little story behind this one. This is a new journal that came out in 2008, very biological. I was amazed when they emailed me and asked me to do an update of our review on childhood adversity and psychosis. I said, no, it's out there now, people either get it or not. I can't keep saying the same thing over and over. And they persuaded me. They, they emailed me and said, this journal goes for free to the 10,000 psychiatrists in America who are most involved in treating schizophrenia. Now, when you have the grandiose delusion, as I do, that I have been sent by God to save, to save the human race from biological psychiatry, that's a very hard kind of um, thing to turn down. So I said, all right, I'll do it. And then I thought, that's bullshit. They can't know that. How do they know that? that I've been conned. So I emailed them back and said, Can you, how do you know which 10,000? And they said, easy. The drug companies send us every year a list in rank order of how much antipsychotic medication each psychiatrist in America has prescribed. That's how good the drug company research is. That's what we're up against. Anyway, to cut this story short, um, or I think in terms of establishing the relationship anyway, although there's, you know, people who aren't on board yet will never be on board, their minds are just too closed, because the evidence is so clear. 2012, we did the first meta-analysis, which is a, it's like a literature review with rules. There's only certain, studies have to be very good to be included. That's what it looks like, I won't bore you with all of that, you have to be to the right-hand side of the line for it to be, and not cross the line for it to be significant. But here's a way, here's some, to summarize that, um, there were 41 studies that met the criteria that were really rigorous studies. And overall, people who had suffered child adversity were 2.8 times more likely to develop psychosis. That's after you control for all of the other possible things that might have contributed, like poverty, gender, location, or everything else. So there's the six types of adversity that we looked at. And it was good to see that the there are some studies of bullying by now because teenagers these days are exposed to a lot more types of bullying than, than we were when we grew up, or I, I was when I grew up, so that's an important factor. Um, so we think we've um, 
pretty much established now what patients in psychiatric hospitals knew all along, and uh, it's only um, some professionals and some academics didn't know that bad things happen, and that's what drives you crazy. And an interesting thing happened in 2016. Robin Murray, who is actually called the Dean of um, Research in Schizophrenia, a leading, possibly the leading researcher from the biological side, uh, he retired and wrote, in the last two decades, it's become obvious that child abuse, urbanization, migration, and adverse life events contribute to the etiology of schizophrenia and other psychoses. This has been a big shift for me. My preconceptions had made me blind to the influence of the social environment. This is very, very important to have a leading psychiatrist acknowledge this. It's a very honorable thing to do. We, I'm not very good at admitting my mistakes. Um, so this is excellent. However, at, at our last uh, international conference in Liverpool, I presented this slide and went on to say, isn't it a shame that it took him 30 years to get there, that he hasn't apologized for all the damage done by the biological theories, and he only manages to get this out after he's retired when he can't be punished in any way. What I didn't realize is that Robin was sat in the back row and it made for a rather interesting lunch, um, which went, so, I'll paraphrase the whole lunch, which basically said, John went like this, John, John, why don't you just write a book about all the mistakes I've ever made in my life? And me replying with, it would take too long. <laughs> but this was all in good banter and at least we were, we were able to talk about it. Uh, that doesn't take away from the fact this is a very valuable thing because psychiatrists sometimes, like all of us, are more likely to hear um, or believe stuff from within our own in-group. We're not so good at hearing stuff from strange groups like psychologists or non-doctors or patients or anti-psychiatry people. That's a great label, isn't it? Anti-psychiatry, it's beautiful. It's such a wonderful label. This is what they do best. If anything they don't understand or frightens them, they apply a label and then they think that label has explained what they don't understand. They do it with schizophrenia and they do it with people who criticize their views. So the reason that John Reed and many other people critique their theories and point out there's no evidence for that, because they have this thing inside of them called anti-psychiatry. So now we know why they do that. Whenever I get called that, I think I'm doing my job well this week. Um, anyway, there's now lots of theories around about how child abuse and neglect leads to psychosis. Um, I'm not going to have time to dwell on them. I'm just going to show you... Uh, I'll just say quickly, sometimes you don't need a theory to understand how bad things happening leads to being crazy. Think about paranoia. What is paranoia? Paranoia is scanning for the next bad thing that's going to happen. That's all it is. And if you've had lots and lots of bad things happen to you, you, you would be mad not to be scanning for the next one, yeah? But you've got to scan, if there's reality, you've got to scan a little bit past what's actually real to make sure you cover everything. Because if you only scan up to here, you're going to miss something and you're going to get done in again. So you have to not only see the things that are likely to come, but some things that actually probably aren't going to come. But it's a you know, paranoia... We all know what paranoia is. This is where you have to nod, otherwise I'm left hanging. You all know that feeling when you walk into the room and you think people have just been talking about you. Three of you nodded. Thank you very much. So, the, but there are useful psychological theories. They all have their merit. I'm just going to talk about one because it includes the brain. So this is the slide that's put up at every schizophrenia conference for the last 30 years. It makes me hide behind my seat and I have to sit on my hands, otherwise I start saying stupid things. And usually I do end up putting my hand up and saying, because this is, this is what they use to show that it's a biological phenomenon. It's a brain disease, okay? You can see it's a brain disease. And I put my hand up and say, excuse me, what do you think a brain is for? And they look at me like, oh, there's a, there's a weirdo in the room. And I say, well, let me put it another way. What use would a brain be that does not respond to the environment? And then some of them, a little light goes on and they begin to see what I'm trying to get at. Because in every other area of neurology, uh, neurophysiology and so forth, where you see the two groups of people with different brains, the first question is, what happened to the one group? In psychiatry, it's, oh, well, that's good evidence that it's brain, a brain disease. It's genetic. Obviously, they were born like that. So 
here's the evidence that schizophrenia is a brain disease. These are the types of so all our textbooks, psychology, psychiatry, social work. Um, and by the end of the uh, 20th century, we finally knew what's going on in the brains of traumatized children. We didn't know that before. So we wanted to, um, in, this, in this paper I put up before, we wanted to see if there was any similarity between these things that are supposed to be the differences between the brains of people with this diagnosis and the rest of us, any similarities between that and what's going on in the brains of traumatized children. And this is what we found. And now the good news is these things are not irreversible. You know, there are changes in the brain when, when kids are traumatized, but they're not irreversible. With proper trauma therapy, which I don't have time to explain right now, those things are reversible. Obviously, it's easier the earlier you, you get in there. It's harder to do when someone's 40 years old, which is all the more reason for asking people and getting in early. Anyway, the, perhaps the important part of all of this is what's the implications for how we deal with people um, with these diagnoses or, or people who hear voices that are telling them bad things. And this is all quite obvious probably to people in this room. Sometimes I have to explain this to medical doctors or psychiatrists, but this is probably clear to all of you. It's important to, when we talk about treatment, it's important to know the limitations of the main treatment that we're currently using. 95 to 99% of people picking up the diagnosis of schizophrenia will be put on antipsychotic medication within 24 hours. If we had a research-based approach, that would be an absolute last resort. And this is why. This is a Cochrane review of Respiridone, which is the, um, one of the most popular antipsychotics. And Cochrane reviews are what you turn to if you really want to know the truth. If you want to know the truth about antipsychotics, you don't go to the drug companies, and perhaps you don't go to John Reed either. You look at a Cochrane review because they are the most respected, neutral, thorough, evidence-based approach to the literature. They say risperidone appears to have a marginal benefit in terms of clinical improvement compared with placebo in the first few weeks of treatment, but the margin may not be clinically meaningful. Now, you may not know that in drug trials, the term clinically meaningful has a very clear definition. It means, can anybody see it? Because you can reduce people's symptoms on a, a 0 to 100 scale by three or four points, but if the patient, the doctor, the um, mum and dad, and the nurses, nobody can see it, then it's not clinically meaningful. And then it goes on to say that the global effect suggests there is no clear difference overall between risperidone and placebo. I'll just let that sit that in. Let that sit in, sink in for a minute. <clears throat> it causes many adverse effects, as we know, including uh, uh, reduced brain size and shortened lifespan. And then it ends with this re remarkable statement. And most Cochrane reviews end with, well, on the one hand and on the other hand, we haven't got enough research, we need better research, we don't know, we've got to be cautious. This one ends with this statement. People with schizophrenia or their advocates may want to lobby regulatory authorities to insist on better studies being available before wide release of a compound with the subsequent beguiling advertising. I have to add at this point, obviously, that some, some of us in the room will be on either these drugs or antidepressants I was talking about before. It is not a good idea on the basis of one person's lecture to change your medication or start coming off it. I just have to, that's an you know, obvious thing I have to... Have to, have to stress. If you're going to make any changes, you do that with a lot of support from a lot of people, and you do it slowly, and if you can, with the support of the prescriber. Which I know isn't always easy, just have to say that. We've done a lot, very large, the largest scale survey to date of people um, on these drugs, and look at the rates of these side effects. And look at the top five. They're all pretty much the same thing. These are tranquilizers. And they do that very well. And I think there's a time and a place when people are really, really stressed out and confused and frightened to, to have something happen to calm them down. And these, these drugs do do that. What they don't do is cure a thing called schizophrenia or deal with voices or delusions. But they do calm people down. Um, there's easier, ways, easier and safer, safer ways to do that. Um, I promised myself a long time ago that I would never give a talk 
uh, anymore without at least mentioning the elephant in the room. Uh, it's not so much the elephant in the room now. People are more aware of this than when we started talking about it. The pharmaceutical industry is hugely powerful, much more powerful than we might realize. Here's just one of many instances of how they're powerful. Um, in 2008, this needs to be doing, we looked at the top 50 websites on schizophrenia, which is where people get their information these days, isn't it? They don't look up textbooks anymore or, or whatever. And, and more, of the, more than half of the websites were funded by drug companies. And surprise, surprise, the ones that were funded by drug companies talked about biogenetic explanations and treatments, and then also described this thing as a de debilitating, devastating, long-term illness that requires medication for the whole of your life. But this is where people are getting their information. But the influence is, is vast. The influence over, drug, over research funding is, is enormous. About 70 to 80 percent of research funding in the area goes to biological and genetic research. It's very hard to get any research into the sorts of things we're research funding for the sorts of things I've been talking about. Um, but they work very hard to um, do what they're supposed to do, which is to increase the uh, profit for their shareholders. They do a good job. So in a way, my anger isn't at them. My anger is at a profession that sold its soul about 30 years ago and has forgotten what a proper boundary is between a professional medical scientific organization and a profit-making organization. Most psychiatric journals are funded by the drug companies. For instance, but I, sorry, I get a bit agitated about so I'll, I'll move on and talk about a couple of um, heroes from psychiatry. Um, some very brave psychiatry. Here's Stephen Sharstein, a little while ago now, head of the American Psychiatric Association, the most biological mental health system in the world in America. Although Australia is trying to catch up, but there you go. He wrote in 2005, trying to wake up his colleagues. If we are seen as mere pill pushers and employees of the pharmaceutical industry, our credibility as a profession is compromised. And here's the bit I wish I'd written, but we got there first. As we address these big pharma issues, we must examine the fact that as a profession, we have allowed the biopsychosocial model to become the bio, bio, bio model. Meanwhile, in, here in the UK, his counterpart, Mike Sh Shooter, put it a little bit more succinctly. I cannot be the only person to be sickened by the sight of parties of psychiatrists standing at the airport desk with so many gifts with them, they might as well have the name of the drug company tattooed across their foreheads. This was the leader of the Royal College of Psychiatrists back in 2005. They could do with some of that leadership again at the moment, I think. A um, little bit on what we know works, and again with the preface that no one thing works for everybody. From a research point of view, cognitive behavior therapy done well with a focus on helping people reduce stress and improve quality of life rather than getting rid of the voices, which doesn't, nothing gets rid of, gets rid of the voices. Um, but anyway, CBT for psychosis is very effective. Um, but here's an interesting twist. Some researchers have gone back over some studies and looked at which bit of CBT works. What's the effective ingredient? And uh, fans of Carl Rogers will be very pleased to hear that what actually is uh, creating the change is not so much those cognitive techniques, although I think they're valuable. I think it's valuable to help us not beat ourselves up and tell ourselves we're horrible and terrible people. Um, I think those are useful techniques. But the most powerful predictor of what works within CBT for psychosis is the quality of the relationship between the two people. Who knew? Who knew that if our difficulties are caused by the bad things that we do to one another, especially when, when we're little, that the solution is people doing nice things to us later? Sorry, that's not very scientific, is it? But, you know, who knew? But this all gets lost under this counting symptoms and applying labels and medication. It's actually, at some level, it's very, very simple. So this is just my nod to Satiria House, because I know Satiria House has been involved in organizing this. We've known for a long time what I just said, what Carl Rogers talked about. Lauren Mosier set up Soteria House and demonstrated with very clear research that pe putting people in houses rather than hospitals, houses where there are people who can just be with, just sit with, not try and fix or do anything to, just be with people. That works far better than all our medical and, and psychological expertise. Um, and a, a, a later day version of that, in some ways, open dialogue also works. 
Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this section, which is actually about whether we're asking in mental health services about abuse and neglect. So I'll, I'll tell you, no, we're not very much. And nor are we responding very well when people do disclose. So I'll move to an end now. We started with a, a villain, so I'm going to end with my hero. Unfortunately, my hero is somebody who looks exactly the same if you turn his head upside down. But we won't do that because that would be making fun of George, and he's really rather a wonderful person. He spent a lot of time, he was the president of the American Psychological Association, spent a lot of time telling us psychologists off for being at the bottom of the cliff, constantly being at the bottom of the cliff. It's too late. He did understand, of course, that therapy for people who have been through terrible things is absolutely necessary. You say, where are you clinical psychologists and the rest of you who know you know what causes these things. You are witnesses to it on a daily basis, if you ask people and if you listen. Where are you advocating for preventative service, for reduction of poverty, for making children's lives safe? Where are you? Um, and he put it like this. Psychologists must join with persons who reject racism, sexism, colonialism, and exploitation, and must find ways to redistribute social power and to increase social justice. Primary prevention research inevitably will make clear the relationship between social pathology and psychopathology, and then will work to change social and political structures in the interest of social justice. It is as simple and as difficult as that. But I'll, I'll end and give the last word to some service users. Um, I'll just set the scene for that. In, when I first arrived in New Zealand, God, 25 years ago. Um, I worked in an inpatient unit and nobody, surprise, surprise, was being asked about abuse or neglect or very much of anything. Um, the nurses and psychiatrists were very open to the idea that we should be doing that. So we devised a policy. It wasn't very complicated. It was that we will just start asking people. We'll put it into the admission sheet. You know, were you abused or neglected as, as a child? Bit naive because we did it without any training. And most of the psychiatrists actually just jumped it, but that's another, another story. But where this bit of research came from is what happened the day before it was about to be introduced, the policy. The head of the medical school at, at Auckland, Univer at Auckland uh, University came down to the ward and said, I'm instructing my psychiatrist not to follow this policy if you introduce it. For three reasons. The first one was the fun one. Psychiatrists aren't bound by, by policies anyway. Imagine the head of nursing saying that. But anyway, but the, the other ones where it's going to upset people. It's kind of legitimate concern. It's going to upset people. It's like that let sleeping dogs lie thing. But the crucial one was you can't trust mad people to tell you the truth. So what's the point of asking them? If they tell you they were abused, it will be part of their schizophrenia. And just so you know, there's very good research to show that there is no higher or lower rate of, of false disclosures around these things amongst people with this diagnosis. It's important to know. Anyway, we counted that with a rather crude survey. Oh, I think it was about 90 people who had been in services longest in Auckland, and we asked them a simple question, what do you think about the idea of everybody being asked about abuse and neglect as they enter the mental health services? And at first they were really angry with, uh, with the master student who was doing this. They said, how dare you come? 30 fucking years I've been in this service, and now you come along from the university to get your master's degree. You want to ask, now you want to ask me about this? And then they sort of calmed down a bit and realized that we were on their side. We were trying to get what they actually felt about never having been asked. And since then I've been run training many, many times on, from mental health professionals on how to ask. And if the statistics I've shown you don't get through, if you can't get through to the head, then we go for the heart. And some of the quotes they gave us in this research really still cut, cut through. And here's some examples, and this is my last slide. There was an assumption that I had a mental illness, and because I wasn't saying anything about my abuse, nobody knew. There were so many doctors and nurses and social workers, and I'm sure psychologists, in your life, asking you about the same thing, mental, 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 but not asking you why. I just wish they would have said, what happened to you? What happened? But they didn't. Thanks very much.